This is Adel Gasly. I'm going to present to you part three of the chapter about synchronous machines. In this part, I will cover the principle of operation of the synchronous machines. I will start with a movie that explains with animations the principle of operation of a synchronous generator or alternator. Alternators are the workhorse of the power generation industry. It is capable to generate AC power at a specified frequency. It is also called a synchronous generator. Electricity is produced in alternators by electromagnetic induction. To generate electricity in a coil, either the coil should rotate with respect to magnetic field or a magnetic field should rotate with respect to the coil. In the case of alternator, the latter approach is used. Rotor and armature coils are the two main parts of an alternator. Rotor produces a rotating magnetic flux. Armature coils are stationary. And rotating magnetic flux associated with the rotor induces electricity in the armature coils. This kind of rotor shown here is known as salient pole rotor. For gaining better insight of its working, let's consider a rotor with just four poles. Rotor coils are excited with a DC power source. Magnetic field produced around it would be as shown. The rotor is made to rotate by a prime mover. This makes the rotor flux also rotate along with it at the same speed. Such revolving magnetic flux now intersects armature coils, which is fitted around the rotor. This will generate an alternating EMF across the winding. Here is a slowed down version of rotor stator interaction. For this four pole system, when the rotor turns half revolution, induced EMF takes one complete cycle. It can be easily established that frequency of induced EMF, rotor speed, and number of poles are connected through following relationship. It is clear that frequency of electricity produced is synchronized with mechanical rotational speed. For producing three-phase AC current, two more such armature coils, which are in 120 degree phase difference with the first, is put into the stator winding. Generally, one end of these three coils are star-connected, and three-phase electricity is drawn from the other ends. It is clear from this equation that in order to produce 60 Hz electricity, a four-pole rotor should run at following RPM. Such huge RPM will induce a tremendous centrifugal force on poles of the rotor and it may fail mechanically over time. So salient pole rotors are generally having 10 to 20 poles, which demands lower RPM. Or salient pole rotors are used when the prime mover rotates at relatively lower RPM. Pole core is used to effectively transfer magnetic flux, and they are made with fairly thick steel lamina. Such insulated lamina reduces energy loss due to eddy current formation. Armature winding of three-phase, 12-pole system is shown here. A stator core is used to enhance magnetic flux transfer. DC current is supplied to rotor via a pair of slip rings. DC current is supplied either from an external source or from a small DC generator which is fitted on the same prime mover. Such alternators are called self-excited. With variation of load, generator terminal output voltage will vary. 
it is desired to keep the terminal voltage in a specified limit. An automatic voltage regulator helps in achieving this. Voltage regulation can be easily achieved by controlling the field current. If terminal voltage is below the desired limit, AVR increases the field current, thus the field strength. This will result in increase in terminal voltage. If terminal voltage is high, the reverse is done. Hope you had a nice introduction to working of alternators. Thank you. To explain the principle of operation of a synchronous generator, we can consider a simple single phase machine as shown in this figure. When a DC feed current flows through the rotor field winding, it establishes a flux in the air gap. If the rotor is now rotated by a prime mover, a revolving feed is produced in the air gap. The rotating flux will link the armature windings AA prime and will induce a voltage in the stator winding. The rotor speed and the frequency of the induced voltage are related by this equation, where F is the frequency of the induced voltage, P is the total number of poles. This reminds us the synchronous speed of the induction machine, which is the speed of the revolving field. Let us consider a two-pole AC generator with only one coil in the stator, AA prime, and one pair of poles. If the rotor speed is n equal 1 revolution per second, then the frequency of the EMF is f equal 1 revolution per second, which is 1 Hz. So we can write the frequency as the ratio of the RPM speed over 60. And for p over 2 pairs of poles, the frequency in Hz of the induced voltage will be p over 2 multiplied by n over 60, which is equivalent to p times n divided by 120. Therefore, for an excitation current IF that generates a magnetic field flux phi, according to Faraday's law, the induced voltage is defined by this, the, this famous equation that we have seen in the transformer and the induction machines chapters. So for a given rotor speed, the magnetization curve or open circuit curve can be determined experimentally by keeping the speed constant and varying the feed current and then measuring the voltage at the terminals of the open circuit stator windings. Now when we load the machine electrically for generator and mechanically for the motor, there will be an armature current which in turn produces a stator or armature flux phi A. This flux affects the resultant flux in the air gap of the machine. This effect is called armature reaction. Let's see what happens inside the machine using the vector diagram representation of the different variables. If EF is taken as a reference for phase angles, the feed flux is in quadrature and leading the feedback EMF. The feed flux and feed EMF are normally in phase. Now for a lagging power factor, the armature current can be represented by this vector the armature flux and MMF are in phase with the armature current, so the resultant flux and MMF are the sum of the field and armature flux and MMF, respectively, as shown in this figure. Now let us analyze the three-phase machine. The rotating flux will link the armature winding AA prime, BB prime, and CC prime, and will induce voltages in the stator winding as shown in this figure. These three phase induced voltages have the same magnitudes but are phase shifted by 120 electrical degrees. The frequency of variation of the induced voltages is directly proportional to the speed of the rotor. While the amplitude is proportional to the speed and feed flux. So you can notice that for constant motor speed, which is the case in generator applications, to keep constant frequency, the induced voltage can be controlled by adjusting the excitation current. 
Let's consider an example of a four-pole synchronous generator that operates at 1,800 RPM. Let's find the frequency of the generator voltage and the speed of the rotor that will give a frequency of 50 Hz. For that, we know that the frequency is defined by this equation. Replacing the number of poles and the speed by their given values, we find that the frequency at 1,800 RPM is 60 Hz. Now, if the frequency is 50 Hz, the speed should be 1,500 RPM, which is calculated as shown here. In the main electric power grid, a large number of synchronous generators are connected together in parallel operations. Therefore, they make what is called an infinite bus bar, where the voltage and frequency of the infinite bus are constant. To connect a generator to the grid, the following conditions must be satisfied. The voltages are the same, the frequencies are the same, the phase sequence is the same, and the phases are the same also. In other words, the generator three phase voltages and the grid phase voltage must be synchronized before connecting them. This process is called generator synchronization with the grid. To synchronize the generator to the grid, we can use synchronizing lamps or we can also use a synchroscope. Both can indicate when the previous four conditions are satisfied before the generator is connected to the grid. For each situation when the previous conditions are not satisfied, the glowing patterns of the lamps is different, which can be used as an indicator which helps us determine what action to do to reach full synchronizations and connect the generator to the grid. We will see in the next slides the different lamp glowing patterns if one of the four conditions is not satisfied. When the voltages are not the same, but the frequency and phase sequence are the same, the difference between the generator and grid voltages has a constant amplitude, therefore, the lamps will have the same brightness that depends on the amplitude of the voltage difference. If the frequencies are not the same, but voltages and phase sequence are the same, the voltage difference will be variable in amplitude, which leads to blinking lamps. Now, if the phase sequences are not the same, but voltages and frequencies are the same, amplitudes of the voltage difference between the generator and grid voltages will be constant, but different from one phase to another. Therefore, in this case, the lamps will have different brightness. Finally, if the phase is not the same, but the voltage, frequency and phase sequence are the same, there will be identical constant three-phase voltage differences which lead to the same lamp's brightness. The following video shows an example of synchronization of a generator with the grid and shows how it is stressful and very complex process. In the evening of September 19th in the Bruce A control room, tension was high as all eyes were on unit one. Operators prepare to synchronize the unit to the grid for the first time in 15 years. Thousands of sensors and gauges throughout the unit feed reams of data back to the control room computers and the main panel. A number of field operators and other specialists were on standby in the control room. Out in the plant, personnel were poised throughout the unit to keep an eye on systems in the field. Even with vibration monitors in place, a Siemens rep walks the turbine train and lays his hands on the casing to feel any vibrations. Inside this turbine generator set are three low-pressure turbines like this one. On one end, where the steam enters the system, a smaller high-pressure turbine is attached. At the other end, inside the generator, is a giant rotor like this. When energized with electricity, it creates a massive magnetic field, which in turn will generate more than 750 megawatts at full power. The whole powertrain weighs more than 800 tons. 
and it's all spinning at 1,800 revolutions per minute. There's no room for error on this project, particularly at this pivotal moment. I guess what I would call it is really careful persistence. Um, and and uh, what I mean by that is, is in, in the nuclear industry, we, also, we need to make sure that, uh, that we're doing things properly. And, and sometimes that means going slow to go fast. And tonight was an example of that. Um, it's, it's a very exciting time for the organization. And uh, when you're coming very close to synchronizing a unit to the grid, um, you, your emotions just want you to go ahead and do that and making sure everything's right and actually going slow and being patient at a time like this is just absolutely critical. T4A is closed and we're online. <laughs> back in 2003, there was cheering and clapping in the control room when units 3 and 4 were brought back. This time around, it was a much different atmosphere. The, the atmosphere, even within the project team this week, has been, been very uh, subdued. We all remember back to May the 7th uh, when we went through with the uh, bringing unit, unit 2 online. So uh, most of the project team have been on pins and needles all week, uh, not wanting to show any emotion, uh, just being very guarded. At full power, the steam pressure coming through the four main lines from the reactor is equal to about seven jumbo jet engines. Tonight at startup and synchronization, the reactor is running at 30% of full power. Brian Smith explains what the operators must do to synchronize this behemoth to the power grid. I mean, basically, there is a series of opening and closing breakers as they go through. So the first thing they do is they, they basically open up and check that the grid system is clear. And then we basically increase the excitation voltage after we close the initial breakers. And we, we basically spin the synchroscopes up. And the, the plan is to close the breakers just before top dead center. And that's exactly what we saw the operator doing. He let it go round in one circle. We were all uh, debating whether he was going to do it on the first, uh, first sweep up. But he said he was going to let it sweep through the, uh, the top dead centre and pick it on the second time up. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. So that's the, the very critical moment where he closes that final breaker. And then we're basically connected to the grid. That was it. At 11.32 p.m., Unit 1 is back online. No cheering, applause or handshakes. The only sign of emotion is a thumbs up and a smile from Station Vice President Mike Burke. It, it was great, you know, a little bit surreal. It's been a long time in coming. We've had a couple of attempts at it. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, for John and I and, and Brian and John Sony, it was a great elation there to sit there and watch the staff also enjoy that moment. Awesome teamwork amongst all of the uh, team players here, both the contractors, our own staff and the uh, folks that we brought in to help us do the testing. So just amazing to see everyone work to push this unit finally over the line. You know, I also think about, uh, you know, the folks in the communities and the surrounding areas, uh, the folks that were here when, um, when we shut these units down and what that really probably means to them, uh, you know, and, and folks that are enjoying retirement as well um, as they hear the news that we've synchronized to the grid. Um, I think it'll be very positive for them as well. So I, I actually think more about uh, you know the folks that were involved when uh, and saw this place when it when it was shut down in 1997 and 1995 uh, for the units one and two and uh, and to see these things revived and back to life. Uh, I think that that would be an extremely powerful feeling. And I'm just proud to be part of uh, of uh, of uh, part of the team that contributed to bringing them back online. So very emotional. Uh, didn't know whether to cry or laugh at the time, so from that point of view, just very emotional watching the seriousness as well of the, uh, the operation staff as they went through. I mean, not a smile, very focused on what he was doing, trying to make sure he was doing this professional, said, so it's, it's just nice to sit back and watch. First sync is a significant milestone, but the unit must go through a whole series of shutdown tests and power increases before the unit is declared ready for commercial operation. This moment is one to mark and celebrate, but there's still a lot of hard work ahead for the Bruce A team. Because we also still have a lot of work to do to get Unit 2 synchronized to the grid and finish off the Unit 4 outage, uh, which is progressing right now. So uh, this is by far a huge success for the organization. Uh, it's another 750 megawatts of clean uh, electricity to the province of Ontario. This is the end of this part. Thank you for watching this video.